want to say good morning to everyone and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Brother Hawk Bolden, and as usual, uh, we're glad to bring you the things that the Lord have laid on our hearts to share with you all. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the third chapter of the book of 1 John. The third chapter of the book of First John. We're going to uh, cover something that I feel like the Lord want us to talk about this morning. And we're going to start reading at verse 4. It says, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is, is, trans, is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sin, sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So, of course, we had been talking about uh, sinners need to repent. So we're going to talk about something that has to do with that so we can get a better understanding of, of this. We're going to read verse 6 again. It says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. We want to focus on that part of it, seeing God and what that really means. He says, if you basically what John is saying here is if you are living in sin, you haven't seen him. You have not seen God. And of course you don't know him if you if you're still sinning. And so why would he say something like that? That if you have if you have if you're still sinning or living in sin, you have not seen him. It's saying, you haven't had a true encounter with him. Seeing God in all of his glory and that holiness there, it'll cause you to change. You see that? It, something on the inside of you should happen that causes a change. When you, you know, yesterday, my wife and I, uh, she had asked me about um, washing the truck, saying that the SUV needed to be washed. And so um, yesterday we went out on a date, and on our way back to the SUV, uh, we saw, I could see. Now, the, it, it is white. And when I got closer to it, the more I could see that it really didn't need to be washed. Now, if you st if you know anything about something that's pure white, because the truck is a pure white, it's not off white, you know, it's as white as white can be on this in this earth. I put it that way. But if you know something about the color white, there are so many different colors of white. It's probably more colors of white than of anything else. You know, even when you know. If you go to, if you have a white wall in your house, you, you pretty much have to take a picture of it and bring it uh, to a paint place or a department in a store to let them match the white because you'll have different colors of white if you ever want to repaint or spot paint your wall. You know, you'll have a different color than what you intend on having. You can't just go to them and tell them white. They have to know what shade of it because it's so many different shades and so yesterday w when we got close to the SUV I could see it clearly okay this is dirty but what happens is a white vehicle if it don't just have a big old blotch of dirt on it it could just look like slowly but surely it's changing but you won't notice it because it's even it's spread evenly 
So you may be driving down the road and drive through some dust or something, and it becomes dirty. But if you're not paying close attention to it, it could just look like it's, everything is fine with it. It'll just look like it's kind of off-white, you know, if you're not paying very close attention to it. And so what can happen is over time, after dust gets on it and things like that, you, you, your eyesight can just uh, can adjust to what you're seeing where it doesn't even look dirty. It looked to you, it looked just as white as it always has looked. You see that? But when a vehicle or something is pure white, then you have something to compare it to, you see. And so that's the way it is in our spiritual walk with the Lord. We can really think that we're doing okay. We can really think, especially if we make the mistake of comparing ourselves to other people. You can really think you're doing okay. Except when you see the Lord, your sin becomes very obvious to you. And you, you know, and when you line it up with his word, it becomes very obvious to you the places that you're coming up short in. And what happens is people get saved and they get used to, you know, thinking about where they've come from. And they're comparing themselves to how dirty they used to be instead of how much more God needs to clean them. So that's what he's saying there in verse 6 of the third chapter of the book of John. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Why? Because when you see God, in other words, when you see him in his holiness, it keeps you... It keeps it in the forefront of your mind how much further you have to go. You're no longer comparing yourself to what you used to be or somebody else and what the world is doing. The world's standard of holiness and righteousness is, is a long distance away from God's standard of holiness and righteousness. So you're no longer doing that. And so you're not surprised and shocked when you hear a preacher preach righteousness and telling you you got to line up with it. It's, it's no longer, woe is me, you picking on me. When you see God and how righteous he is, and the Lord tells us to be perfect like he's perfect, then you know you got some growing to do, and you're not mad about it. You're not offended by it. You know now, hey, I need to be I need to continue in this cleansing process instead of I've already arrived thank the Lord I'm not what I used to be so if you are still sinning it's because you haven't seen God God haven't in other words God have not made it obvious to you the difference between your white and his you just you still walking around dirty, off-white, and don't know it. Thinking that you're clean because you're comparing yourself to some very dirty people. That's what Paul means when he says they comparing themselves to themselves is not wise. Anybody can do that. You can take the biggest sinner in the world and they can compare themselves to somebody that's worse than them and think they're going to heaven. But that's not... that's. Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see? And so it's not enough to think, well, I thank God I'm not what I used to be, or I'm not like that person, even if you're not saying that with your mouth, you're doing it subconsciously. You see that? I'm telling you, it's something to that. And the devil will let you do that to make you think you're okay. And then when somebody comes to straighten it up, you got a problem and an attitude because you've gotten used to your off-white. And let me make this clear. Off-white is not the same as white. Your holiness and standard is not the same as God's standard. And I think people go to sleep and they get, they get comfortable with God and they put it on cruise control thinking that they have arrived. My uh, youngest son and I, my wife, we went fishing Saturday, 
and uh, we so we let my wife out of the boat because we were about to go way across somewhere, you know, to this little island. And you know how something is, sometimes it is, especially when you're out on water, you really notice it then, that something can appear to be close, closer than what it is. And you find out when you get to rowing and try to get close, closer, it seems like the closer you get, the further away it gets. So, you know, my son said, I said, so Joshua, what do you want to do? He said, I, let's go over there to that island. I said, okay. I said, that's a pretty long way now. He said, yeah. I said, you sure you up for it? Yeah, okay. So we started rowing. And it seemed like, I guess we rowed, seemed like for about 30 minutes and still wasn't there. And so I could see how, you know, I'm sitting in the back of the boat and he's sitting in the middle rowing. And I could see how he just started slumping over like, I could tell his mind was changing. And so we I turned around and looked and saw how far away we had gotten from where we started from. But it's it you know, then turning around and looking at where we were going, it just seemed like, man, this is just this is a pretty long trip. Like seemed like we should have been there by now but still had a ways to go. And what happens is when people are rowing in their spiritual life, they're just looking behind them to see how far they've come instead of looking in front of them to see how much further they have to go. And they judge the trip of their spirituality is based on how far they've gotten away from where they were instead of, let me keep my eyes on where I'm going. And so just to finish that particular story, I saw his shoulder slump over. I'm sure he was tired, and then it was hot and all of that. So I asked him, I said, Joshua, do you want to keep going? And he didn't answer. Normally when he don't answer, I know what that means. So I said, Joshua, if you want to, we could turn around and go back. He's like, yeah, let's turn around and go back. I'm ready to go back. So I said, okay, we'll do that. But it it, it shows you Something can look closer than what it is until you get on that trip. Until you're actually going through the motions. And that's the way it is with people spiritually. So they could see it and you think, because I see it, hey, it's within reach. But let me make this clear. You know, we didn't speak when we were making that trip to that island. We didn't speak ourselves to be there. There was a journey that we had to go through. There was a process that we had to go through, uh, you know. And, and quite possibly, you could get tired on that journey. And so what, many, what happens many times is people see where they need to go, but then they get weary during the process. And if you're not careful, you'll just stay still. You see that? And so it doesn't do you any good to get out there and not keep going to your destination. And that's where people are in the Lord. I'm satisfied where I am. I'm not where I used to be. I, but really, I'm not where I need to be, but I'll just stay where I am. So they base their spirituality off of them not being what they used to be. The only problem is if you don't keep going and get to your destination, you'll, you'll, fall, you'll fall back. We were, well, the other day when we were rowing, we were rowing against current. That current was pushing us back to where, you know, we were... Uh, had come from. So we had to row extra hard to fight against the current. And that's the way it is in life. In your spiritual walk with the Lord. You can't just stand still when you get in the middle somewhere, you know, and just thank God that you're not where you used to be and then quote, you know, and say, well, nobody's perfect. In other words, nobody's going to really reach that destination. So you can't stay still because the devil is sending current your way to push you back to where you used to be. If you are standing still, you're already backsliding. If you're not growing, you're going in the opposite direction. That's pretty much the way it is. So you have to keep going. If you are sinning, it's because you have not seen the Lord. You can't see the Lord and stay the way that you are. You'll see something. If you've seen the Lord, you will see something in your life 
that's not lining up with the word and you will want to you will see just how unclean you are in other words you will stay looking ahead and see just how far away from that island that you are and it'll make you want to continue to go forward instead of looking back at where you've come from and how far you've come you see that so let's go look at that in the Word of God if you have your Bibles let's go to the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah Sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah, and we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So he had six wings, two of them covered his face, two of them covered his feet, and the and one of them and the two of them um, uh, he flew with. Verse three, and one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts; the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So, he's saying here that in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord. Now, by this time, Isaiah had been prophesying for years. God had been using him for years. But when King Uzziah died, that was the year he saw the Lord. And so then he talks about these seraphims, which are like angelic beings. He talks about what he saw. He said he saw these seraphims and they had six wings, so three on each side. The wings up closer to the face or towards the top of the body, they covered his face, the, the seraphim's face. The two wings at the bottom covered the feet, and the ones in the middle, that's he flew with. Now why is this symbolic? These angels or seraphims were in the presence of God. The wings covering the, the face showed that they, they couldn't see the Lord because of his holiness. The wings covering the feet shows that they were careful in how they treaded around God. And many people are not careful that way today. They could be in the presence of God and just walk the way they want to walk and, and, and do what they want to do. And it shows that they have not seen God. You have not seen God when you can live the way you want to live. You don't know how dirty you are. And so these angels, with their face covered by wings, could not see God. But he said he saw them. So let's read what he says. Verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am what? In other words, I haven't made it to that island yet. Never mind, I've been prophesying for several years already. And many people think because God is using them that they have arrived. But the year he saw God, he understood what kind of man he was. I am undone. Well, in other words, just because the Lord is using me don't mean that I'm complete. I need to keep growing. Let's go and keep reading. Because I am a man of unclean lips. Why didn't he know that in the first chapter, several years ago, when he first started prophesying? Because he had not seen God yet. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. 
he repented when he saw the Lord. You see how merciful God is? He could see then, if you've ever stood in the presence of God, you are aware of this one thing, just how unclean you are and, and how you need to grow. And what makes it sad is some people may never see the Lord in that instant the way with, with visually see him. So how do the average person see God? Through the mirror of his word. When God brings his word, that is equivalent of you seeing him. Now, as long as the word is being preached and you're denying it, or as long as somebody's speaking the word to you to share it, to tell you, and you can come up with excuses of why you and how to get around it, you'll never come to it. And, and every time it's a slap in God's face. Because God is showing you clearly what's going on in your life, and if you don't receive it, who's in trouble? Now, God is only interested in showing himself to people who are willing to receive it. And you can get yourself in a place where God will just stop talking to you. You'll just be on your way to hell and not know it. Yeah, you'll be in church, you'll be preaching, you'll be prophesying, but on your way to hell... And many people want all kind of signs and all of these things to prove that it's God talking to them. But let me make this clear. Unholiness can't stand in that presence. It can't stand there. You'll be just like the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt and they got tired of hearing and listening to Moses. We want to see God for ourselves. And then when God came down... They saw exactly what Isaiah saw, smoke. He was choking them out and they took off running. He brought fire with him. That God is a consuming fire according to the word of God. And anything that's impure, he, he's going to burn. And while they were running away from that presence, they were saying, get away from us. We'll hear Moses now. They didn't understand how privileged they were to have God to send somebody to them. Moses was holy and pure. He could sit before God face to face and talk with him. Everybody ain't there. And the ones that's not there, you just need to buckle up and hear what God's preachers have to say. Quit thinking you're going to sit face to face with him. Because you ain't determined yet to give up all those impurities yet. If people want that kind of relationship with God, but still want to live in sin. That fire that God comes with is a consuming fire. It's going to burn you if you're not pure already. So all of that inward turmoil you got going on, it'll burn you. You're not ready for it. So just be glad when God sends somebody to you to, to help you. Because if he's sending somebody to you, it means that they have paid a price. And it's really for your benefit. They have taken the bullet that you don't, that you're not willing to take. You see that? So several years after Isaiah's ministry began is when he saw the Lord. And the first thing he notices is how undone he is. You see what he says? Verse 6. Uh, actually, uh, verse 5 says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Now, when the, Lord, uh, when the Lord would speak to Isaiah, he knew that it was because God wanted him to prophesy. But notice, when he's in the presence of God, it's no longer about what everybody else is doing and how God can use me to reach other people. Now it's about, hey, I see me. I need to get right. There's some things in me, and let me make this clear, where many folks make their mistake at is they feel like because they have grown that maybe they don't have any other areas to grow in. And that's not true. And because something is not obvious to them that 
they're okay in that area. You think it was obvious to, to Isaiah in the beginning of his ministry that he had unclean lips? No. Because if it was obvious to him, he would have been prayed about it. He would have been talking to God about it. It didn't become obvious to him until he saw the Lord. And so, when somebody brings something to you, just because it's not obvious to you, don't mean it's not so. And so, it's, it takes faith for you to believe what a God-sent preacher is saying. Quit trying to figure it out in your twisted mind. That's where you make your mistake at. That's why you keep falling into the same junk you've been falling into, because you're trying to figure it out with your unconverted mind to begin with. An unconverted mind will not figure out what kind of sin it needs to change. That's revealed by the Spirit of God. And so it takes somebody with that Spirit to relay it over to you. And if you try to figure it out with your mind, you'll just keep falling back into it. The same way you have to believe God and His Word for salvation, you have to believe Him through the conversion part, through the cleansing part. So when God sent a preacher to you to tell you about yourself, the last thing you want to do is, is try to flip it or turn it around some kind of way and not receive it. Because it's not obvious to you. It may have not been obvious to you that you were on your way to hell. It's got a whole lot of folks on their way to hell and it's not obvious to them. They really think they're okay. So we know it's possible to have that kind of mindset. And so why did John tell us that he that is sin and living in sin have not seen God? It's because when you see God, God makes the what was unobvious to you or what you were oblivious to, he makes it apparent. He makes it obvious to you. And that's God's desire for us. When you've seen God, you'll stop sinning. You'll have, your, you'll have a pure white to compare yourself to instead of looking behind you and seeing how far you've come. You'd be looking ahead to see how much further you have to go. Amen. We want to say thank you all for joining us today. We pray that something has been said that has been a blessing to you. We pray that you will continue to listen in to this broadcast. Have a blessed day.